Simon Roberts is an anthropologist with a long-standing long interest in technology. His career bang, began with a PhD on the satellite TV re revolution in the mid-1990s India. He started the UK's first dedicated ethnographic research company, Ideas Bazaar, before leading an R&D team at Intel's Digital Health Group. In 2013, Simon co-founded Stripe Partners, a strategy and innovation consultancy based in London. He's currently writing a book on embodied knowledge, don't ask him how many words he's up to, <laughs> which will be out in 2020. <laughs> Simon's talk will explore whether we can have intelligence without a body, and if not, what does that mean for the development of AI and how we think about our relationships with it? Please welcome Simon to the stage. Thank you, Dawn, and well done for getting this together, getting us in a room. Uh, I'm going to try and not be tethered to that. So um, I'm not a technologist. Uh, thank you, Julian, for setting me up for a fall. Um, what am I? Um, I'm an anthropologist. And yes, as Dawn said, I want to talk a um, bit of a sort of a, a change of scene. I want to talk about the body and I want to talk about brains and I want to talk about intelligence and, and, um, and, how, they, and how they relate to each other. And I want to do that by, by starting with a story about a, a ship that was sailing from, from Holland uh, to Sweden in about 1660, aboard which it was reputed uh, to be a, a, a kind of a lifelike um, doll or automaton. And automatons were very, uh, very a la mode at this point in history. Uh, the, the elites, uh, the rich, had them as playthings. Uh, even the philosopher Descartes was reputed to have built a flying pigeon and um, people built things like defecating ducks. Um, and the interesting thing about what was on the boat was that it was reputed to be Descartes' uh, daughter uh, in automaton form. And there's, it's a myth, right? And it's been a myth that's circulated for, for centuries and, and is often rolled out in, in, in articles and, and books. And there's some, been some lovely analysis of, of what that myth sort of tells us about, about how we think about robots and artificial intelligence. What I think it does say, without getting into the detail of that, is I think these, these robots, these automatons, more like, at the time, embodied a particular view of the world and of the universe, which was extremely mechanistic. Um, and the idea that Descartes, this is Descartes' daughter, um, is, is fascinating for me because um, just whatever his reasons and whatever the alleged reasons for for shipping such a doll, which it got thrown overboard, by the way, by a crew that was terrified of, of this lifelike, uh, ghoulish, um, but in other accounts, very sexy blonde, uh, hence the, 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 gender, the gendering of, of technology there for you. But um, what it does is, is explain a view of the world um, in which objects or bodies are given a given life by something else, and, and more specifically given life by, by brains, right? So there's this idea emerging at this point in history that the body is somewhat irrelevant. And, and in a way, <clears throat> more than that, the body is something that doesn't really play any role in our intelligence. It plays no formal contribution. Uh, the mind is where objective, rational knowledge of the world can come from. And the body at best is, is about subjective, uh, understanding or feeling, um, and at worst is possibly misleading, right? And I think this idea in many ways continues to uh, echo through our accounts, not only of, of ourselves. Um, we all know, for example, um, that, um, uh, well, I'll forget that. Um, but we all, we, we all see echoes of this. I think sometimes we talk about this as being the century of the brain or the decade of the brain. Um, many, many fields use, you know, elevate the mind um, uh, to, uh, to, to great heights um, and ignore the body uh, in, in many ways. And I think what emerges from, from kind of this, this period in history is the idea that the mind is an information processing device. 
And, and I think what that kind of, what that involves is, is a particular view of intelligence or what the mind does as something that takes in symbolic kind of representations of the world. Nowadays we think of that as code, takes it in and processes it. Um, and that everything else is, is in a way kind of uh, yeah, irrelevant to kind of how we make sense of, of the world. So once that view kind of became established, it became very easy then to think, well, how do we understand the world? Well, it's, it's symbolic representations. We, we build things, right? And then we can compute. So we, we, we quickly moved from the mind being kind of at the top of the pack and the mind doing a certain type of thing uh, with information from the world to saying, okay, well, we can automate that. And so, you know, around the time of Descartes, you get the first calculator. And of course, we then get um, uh, ideas like Babbage's uh, analytical engine, the difference machine. And of course, what we now have is, uh, or at least starting in the 50s or 60s, the idea of good old fashioned artificial intelligence, right? And what is that? That is essentially an idea about taking symbolic representations and, and crunching them. So there's a long trajectory here which does an incredibly good job of minimizing what intelligence actually is or curtailing a view of what intelligence is. Um, and at the same time does a fantastic job too of keeping the body um, in its place. Um, and so I think, I suppose in, 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 in essence, my argument is that if we think of, of kind of, intel, of human intelligence um, in this way, it, it's a very constrained way of thinking about it. And we can only recreate intelligence if we stick to this incredibly constrained view of, of what it really is. Um, and I suppose at this point, you, you might be saying, well, well, what does he mean by intelligence? So I'll give you following a roboticist called Rodney Brooks, a very simple answer to that question, which is it's the ordinary stuff that most of us do every day. And a lot of this talk is really about the ordinary stuff that most of us do every day, which I think is amazingly intelligent, but it's also incredibly difficult to replicate. And so this isn't, in a sense, a talk about why humans are brilliant and why technology is bad, nor is it necessarily, although I'm not a technologist, it, is in an argument to say that you know, artificial intelligence is a waste of time. But I think I do believe that what we have as humans is ultimately impossible to replicate because of the existence of our bodies. And without that, the rest of this adventure that everybody's engaged in around AI and the discourse around AI is fundamentally misleading. Um, uh, and, and therefore, you know, my contribution in a sense, a small one albeit, is to try to put the body back into the frame as a way of, of really valuing what it is that we have as humans um, and what it, what it is that, that the machines will never be able to replicate. And, and not to do that to say, Yavu sucks, technology, stay over there in the corner, we, we're, we're always in, in control, but rather to allow us to revel in, in, a, in a superpower that we have, a superpower which emanates from the body. And I suppose, in a way, although I'm an anthropologist, this is an incredibly pretentious thing to say, I'm a sort of an anthropologist who's become a phenomenologist. Phenomenology, I won't go into the details of it, it's forbiddingly abstract um, writing that began in the 1880s, 1890s. Some of the exemplars of it are, are, are people like Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Um, and the fundamental kind of idea that they bequeath us is that the body is at the heart of how we experience the world. You know, the mere fact that we are in and of the world, the world comes to us, it reveals itself to us through the body, much more than the mind. And in fact, what they would argue is that the body is at the heart of, of our cognitive life, right? So we can't have thinking without a mind that is in itself embodied, right? So the body is not just a transportation device, which is usually how it gets presented. This is the crown jewels. This stuff is just, you know, late 40s, slightly bulging, but that's the kind of, that's what it is. That's just transportation. This is where the action happens. No, say the phenomenologist, the action is, is the whole package, right? Um, and that's really important. And it's important for lots of different 
uh, disciplines, actually. So I don't know if anybody's ever read Do No Harm by, by Henry Marsh. It's the most brilliant book. Um, but even people like that who spend their days fiddling around in the middle of people's brains whilst conscious people are um, telling them um, whether they're feeling any better. Um, yeah, even people like Henry Marsh realize through their great wisdom, I think, and their embrace of a multidisciplinary view of, of things, and maybe he's read Morris Merleau-Ponty too, that actually brains don't come as kind of these isolated things, right? They come on top of bodies with beating hearts that exist in a world. We interact with the world. That is what gives us our, 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 our intelligence. And, and I suppose a thought experiment here, because there are lots of transhumanists and others, you know, nice Silicon Valley startups that have fantastic ideas about uploading brains into the cloud. You know, so once your body's kind of you know, withered away, they can take your brain, upload it, and, and there you have it. We've got intelligence in the cloud. And you have to say, well, what would that look like? What would a brain in the cloud look like? What would a brain in a vat look like? What information would it be receiving? What would it be processing? Nothing, right? I mean, what, what would it be? There's no sensory involvement of anything, no information that it can receive and, and process in any meaningful way. And what I think is, is sort of fascinating about the phenomenologists is that so many disciplines now are circling their wagons around these ideas. So, you know, in many ways, I think this needs, we need a kind of a wake-up call. Yes, there are social scientists in the room and there are technologists. Maybe there are neuroscientists. Maybe there are cognitive sciences, scientists. Maybe there are neurophysiologists. Maybe there are psychologists. All of those people, fascinatingly for me, are starting to realize that with, without the mind and the body coming together, we don't really have anything that we can meaningfully call intelligence. We can put it more strongly, without a body, there can be no intelligence. But also that the body, more fundamentally, every day kind of affects how the mind thinks, right? So we need to think much more in terms of both embodied mind, but also about embodied cognition. And so what I want to do, I suppose, is to say, <clears throat> let's, let's sort of take a step back from, from, that, from that kind of set of ideas and say, Let's take something that we all do every day, or we maybe do every day, or hopefully we do less every day than we used to do every day, which is drive a car. And driving a car is, at one hand, a very, very simple thing. Once you know how to do it, you really don't think about it. You don't think about it as much as you should, um, but we don't think about it when we're doing it. It's also something that, of course, huge amounts of money are flooding into um, in Silicon Valley and, and, and elsewhere. Um, but it's also something that um, is a great example of, of audacious claims being met by the, the trough of reality, right? Which is, this stuff's really, really hard to do. So I don't want to stand here and say it can't be done or it shouldn't be done or it will never be done. I'm not qualified to make those kind of assertions. What I do know is that most of the car companies who made audacious claims have stood on platforms like this and said, ow, uh, it's actually quite hard. We're struggling with this. So I want to talk about the human element of driving and five dimensions of, 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 of driving, which I think are a really good way of explaining some of the superpowers that bodies have, and then use that as a way to kind of illuminate, if you will, kind of five further dimensions of, of human intelligence, which um, I see as, as unique, I see as quite difficult to reproduce, um, and in some ways that then lay down a challenge for people who, uh, who, who labor under the idea that technology can do all of this. Um, so one of the things that happens when you start to drive a car happens before you even ever sit behind the wheel of a car, which is that you observe how people are driving. And you, know, you sense the gear changes. Um, you, you hear the engine straining on a hill. You see the driver shifting through the gears, applying pressure on the brakes, signaling, and, and doing all of this stuff. And observation is is amazing actually because just by merely observing things we can learn how to do things. So 
all of these examples, I'll try to use some, some examples from the science because I'm committed to the idea that an anthropologist should not stay in its, his disciplinary furrow. And, and people talking about the idea of motor simulation have shown very, very clearly how understanding of things comes through the body. So mundane skills like driving cars, but also anthropologists have observed craftspeople um, learning how to build very intricate structures. Um, one of them in, 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 in Yemen writes about the fact that there was really no formal instruction given about how to, to build the things that these craftspeople were building. They were learning through observation because their body was essentially mirroring the actions of others. Small muscle innovation was happening that allowed their body to reproduce what they were seeing. So one thing the body can do is to learn merely by by watching something. The second thing is, of course, we all know that as you do things more, you get better at them. And, and what's going on there? Well, a lot of what's going on there is that, you know, the early days when you're driving a car and I'm just trying to teach my son to drive, you know, you're telling them what to do. So there's lots of rule sets and instructions. Do this, they do that. The RAC have a wonderful kind of list of how to drive a car. And you look at that and you think, yeah, right, you know, that is necessary, but it's by no means sufficient for being able to fluidly drive a car. So computer scientists like rules, right, but we don't drive cars by recourse to rules. We drive cars by essentially turning linguistic instructions into non-linguistic procedures, and then we can just do it. And as we do it more, we get better practiced at it. Um, and as we get better practiced at things, we're much better able to improvise. So you're flying down this, this tunnel and a cardboard box appears in front of you. What do you do? You've never seen it before. You've never been on this bit of road before. There's no neural pathway in your brain that says, this is what you do when you see this box at this time on this road with these cars behind you in these weather conditions traveling at this speed. But you know what to do. So improvisation for me is about the amazing ability that humans have to deal with situations that are exceptional and unique every single moment of every single day. The world just comes at us and we're able to deal with it. We are not reliant on, on rule sets or procedures or instructions um, and, and yet we can, we can do things. And I think this is a very hard challenge for people working in this space. Oxford University did a study just examining a four-mile four stretch of road. Even the road itself changed dramatically over the course of, of that year. The shading from leaves, the street furniture moved, there were roadworks, cars were parked in different places. Everything was changing. And that, that makes a very difficult kind of boundary condition for building anything that can operate in this space. But it doesn't challenge us. And I find that utterly fascinating and worth holding on to as an idea. The other thing that we do when we're driving is, you know, it's not pure functional tasks, right? It's not just, even if we're not thinking about it, um, we need to understand what's going on around us. Again, one of the things that's very difficult for AV engineers is, is understanding other people's intentions. What is that person doing? Are they about to cross the road or are they going round to get into the passenger seat? How do I know what they're doing? Well, again, we're pretty good at this. OK, there are accidents. There are more accidents than anyone would, would like to happen. But fundamentally, actually, driving is a reasonably safe task um, or activity. Um, so how, how is it that we understand others? Well, it won't surprise you to hear that the body is central to how we understand others. And, and uh, it was some neurophysiologists and neuroscientists in the late 90s in, in a lab in Palmer who um, were running some experiments to understand what was happening in the brains of a macaque monkey uh, as it performed uh, some tasks like eating peanuts. And they saw particular areas, motor uh, connected areas of the brain lighting up um, as they performed these experiments. And then they all went off for lunch and, and true to at least true to the stereotype in the retelling of the story, the research assistant came in after lunch eating his gelato, as you do, and, um, and he noticed that these same areas in the monkey's brain were lighting up as he was eating, 
as had been showing up in the, in, 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 on their displays when the monkey was, was performing a similar task. And they thought that was very curious, and it was in this motor area. So what they kind of had identified, essentially, is that the same bits of a, of a, of, of a brain in a monkey were, were, were firing, the same neurons were firing when they watched somebody perform a task as when the task was being performed by them themselves. And because of that equivalence, they talked about these as mirror neurons. And mirror neurons have been, you know, there's evidence on one side and there's evidence on the other. I think the body of the evidence is, is quite strongly in favour of mirror neurons both existing, that I think is undoubted, but also their significance as a fundamental feature of human physiology which allows us to us understand what other people are thinking and feeling. Um, and so when you talk about, I feel your pain, you know, or I feel your disgust or, you know, as you eat something revolting, the mere fact of seeing somebody else's lips curl up as they smell that, whatever it is, um, you, you're simulating that yourself. You're then able to, 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 to empathize with, um, with, with, what they are, with what they are feeling. And so this kind of mirroring, which you know, has been shown to uh, drive a lot of social communication, uh, cogn you know, social cognition, how we understand others, how we judge the mood of a room, all of these things, uniquely kind of human ability to just to judge the weather in a room, what's going on, people's moods, all kind of, all well explained by, by neurophysiology and neuroscience and vital when you're out on the road in understanding what other people may be thinking or about to do. And one of the things that we always talk about the body as being great at doing is storing information, right? So proverbially we talk about kind of muscle memory, very kind of everyday use of the idea um, of, of the body retaining knowledge, but, but actually the body can retains lots of other knowledge. So muscle memory, formally speaking, you know, speaks to kind of our, our ability to, to, to retain kind of procedural knowledge, so back to the car, kind of changing gears and, you know, uh, and what have you. But of course it also has cultural dimensions because culture comes to reside in the body. How you act in different environments is, is very bodily, you know. I can use my body at one way at a music festival in you know, southwest England with hundreds of thousands of other people around me, but my body needs to respond entirely differently when I'm in London's Wigmore Hall li listening to some Beethoven. So the body you know, needs to store that information and does store that information to allow it to act culturally appropriately and to know what to do in the right situation. So those are sort of five features, if you will, that I think reveal really nicely uh, mechanisms, as it were, characteristics, qualities of the body and its ability to, to, to enable us to be intelligent, to be smart, to get around the world um, both smoothly if we're driving but also culturally appropriately. Um, and at the heart of this is, is the fact, as the phenomenologist said, our body is our anchorage in the world, our body is you know, where we all start from in, in, in understanding the world. And that has huge implications, right, for building AI, because if we move away from this idea that the world is, 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 is some, some symbolic representations, which we can kind of code up and feed into a machine, but rather that the world is multi-sensory and, and has so many, there are so many data points in here, right, that I'm using to make sense. The idea of, of, of compiling those into, a, into one of Julian's, you know, Excel spreadsheets and running a macro on it if you want to keep it simple or running something more complicated on it if you don't. That's such an impossibly large task. You know, even, even doing that for, for something simple like a car, right, where the variables coming at you are so enormous and so unique, um, that um, we don't struggle with it, right? So, so one of the things I think is, you know, one of the things I think is going on here is, is the fact that, that humans, although we like to talk about rules, and if you ask people, as anthropologists often do about things, oh yes, we eat as a family every Sunday or, or something like that, we like to present life as kind of very rule-based, 
but it's not. And we have this amazing ability to, to live without defined rules. Of course, there are norms. There are lots of other things that structure our behavior, which we are very good at learning to, to kind of understand and incorporate. But, but the fundamental point here is that what is unique, I think, about embodied intelligence is, is its rule independence. It's just not reliant on, 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 on rules to quite the same extent. The other thing we're amazing at doing is pattern recognition. Now, clearly, AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, is, is getting much better at that too, right? But, um, but often it's very good at doing that in quite constrained, in quite constrained ways. Is this tumor malignant? Is it benign? You know, here's a burning house. Is it going to fall down on top of the firefighters or not? How would I even know? Well, decision-making kind of analysts like Gary Klein have done lots of work that's shown that people like firefighters are amazingly good at using their experience to understand just when it's time to get the hell out of a house because it's about to collapse or when to bring back up or make very, very good decisions. So our, 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 our ability to, to do pattern recognition, fundamentally starting from the body outwards, um, is something that, that can be mimicked and, and reproduced, but not in such kind of conditions of complexity um, that humans are able to deal with. Um, I love Indian food. Um, and the amazing thing about this meal was that it was a place I used to eat in India, actually. And I went back sort of five years later, and the taste was exactly the same. It was like sort of Proust's kind of Madeleine. It was just this kind of memory that just came back of the same thing. Um, that's a side point. That's retention. That's, you know, that's, that's that kind of idea of, of memory staying in the body. But also, of course, as every good Instagrammer knows, food has meaning. And yes, a machine can recognize what this is. This is a tali, and it's a vegetarian one, and it's got this. But what, what does it mean? What does food mean? Food has such massive semiotic kind of versatility, virtuosity. Well, how do we even start to think about what that means to people um, that are eating it, to the hierarchies amongst people that are having it distributed to them, to, to all of the things that actually make life what it is, right? which is a meaningful kind of... Um, uh, a collection of experiences and relationships. So, yes, we can recognize, machines can recognize, but we can also make meaning, and it's much more than just, you know, the zeros and ones that constitute that picture. The third thing, I mean, I, I hope there are no roboticists in here. I don't mean to have a cheap laugh at the expense of roboticists, but, um, you know, as, as Moravec's kind of um, paradox says, you know, you can, you know, use computing to create you know, very, very fine perceptual reasoning, um, but you can't get machines to even mimic you know, the versatility, the sensory motor versatility of a three-year-old child. Right? And let's just reflect on the fact that we are incredibly practical as a species um, and are able um, to far outwit anything that Boston Dynamics, thank God, can throw at us. The final um, quality, I think, of human embodied knowledge is, is transferability. So go back to this idea of, of life not being about rules. Um, we are really, really capable of, of, of dealing with new situations, um, of taking what we know and applying it in new situations. And again, my understanding of AI may be uh, somewhat poor, um, and, and, and apologies if, if, this, if this statement is, is not quite accurate, but my sense of a lot of where a AI or machine learning has been excellent is, you know, is in domains where it can't operate as soon as it's, as soon as it's taken somewhere else. So yes, you know, here's chess, great, done it. You know, here's go, great, done it. Okay, take that algorithm and say, you know, do this. Oh, well, I don't know that domain, I can't do that, right? And, and I think that domain kind of transferability that human knowledge uh, has is, um, is something that we should reflect on and, and celebrate. And so to sum, I suppose, is to say, look, from the body and, uh, and the idea of an embodied uh, mind and, 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 and cognition being embodied, we have these five, I think, very, very powerful uh, kind of uh, uh, capabilities, which, in my view, result in 
intelligence. Intelligence being that practical, day-to-day, -day, earthy stuff that all of our lives are involved in. And so to finish, this is not to say humans good, technology bad, but rather to set up a series of challenges, I suppose, to say let's remember that it's our body, not our minds alone, that give us what's unique about us. And that for AI uh, engineers and uh, inventors and funders, um, let's be a little bit more sanguine, shall I say, about what's really possible uh, without a body. Thank you.